Okay. Um, welcome to the March uh, 20, uh, 22nd, 2023 special joint meeting of the Library Commission and the Parks and Recreation Commission. This is a hybrid meeting with commissioners, city staff, and members of the public participating at the Bellhaven Branch Library in accordance with public health guidelines and in-person meeting and members of the public participating remotely. Um, Ashley, would, would you mind um, letting us know if we have any commissioners that are unable to be here in person? Yes, Commissioner Bassett, oh, excuse me, Vice Chair. Okay, very good. Um, so I'm gonna present the commissioners um, and list accordingly. So, so Jennifer Baskin, Vice Chair is on remotely, correct? Yes, correct. And um, just to um, let you know, in accordance with the um, AB 2449, just cause um, is for child care. Terrific. And um, next is Commissioner Aurora uh, Brosnan. Aurora is actually not going to be able to do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark Bryman, here. Um, Mayrin Bunyagit, here. I even said it almost right. Thank it's you. <laughs> I believe Peter, or uh, no, Peter uh, Deppenbrock. Deppenbrock, I was so close. I'm sorry. Uh, Commissioner Peter Joshua is not here, um, and Commissioner Kelsey Terrio. Yeah. Here. Okay, terrific. And in the Library Commission, uh, myself, Alan Cohen, Chair, Commissioner Ada Chen um, Raycon? Reiki. Reiki, yeah. I'm sorry. No problem. David Earhart? Here. Katie Hadrovic? Here, present. Kristen Leap? Here. And Pavneet Singh? Wasn't sure if he was on remotely, perhaps not. And Vasmi Valagapudi? Not here. Okay. Um, and then also attending our Library and Community Services Director, Sean Reinhardt. Interim Assistant Community Services Director, Rondell Howard. Assistant Library Services Director, Nick. Becca, A. Um, LCS Supervisor, Natalia Jones. Hello. And Management uh, Analyst, Ashley Walker. A. Um, Ashley will now be helping to facilitate the meeting. Ashley, will you please take a moment, provide instructions to the commission and members of the public on how the meeting will proceed. Thank you, Chair. For members of the public who are attending this meeting virtually and wish to provide public comment after the chair calls for public comments on the item you wish to speak on, please engage the raise hand feature at the bottom of the screen. For those who are calling in from the landline or cell phone, press star nine to raise your virtual hand. For members of the public attending in person, there are speaker cards available at the front of the room at the table. Please complete one and turn it into staff before public comments are called for the item you wish to speak on. Because tonight's meeting is a special joint meeting, there is no call for general public comment. Therefore, public comment will be limited to the items on the agenda. However, members of the public are welcome to send feedback on any subject to the online suggestion box at memorplus.gov slash feedback or in writing in the suggestion box. Any comments submitted with contact information will be responded to by staff, and all comments will be published in the agenda package for review by both commissions. With that, I will turn the meeting. Great, thank, thank you, Ashley. Um, we'll begin tonight with item C1, a presentation and update on the Realized Flood Park Project. Nicholas Calderon, Director of San Mateo County Parks, will present this item. And he will be doing this virtually. I I will be sorry. I'm just setting myself up here. I I apologize. Um, uh, also having uh some storm related uh damages. Uh, and so my family and I are, are currently uh, uh dealing with that. But uh, balancing 
uh, work in childcare, as many of us are aware. Um, and I, I just want to know, should I share my screen for the presentation and the PowerPoint, or is that something that um, you all would like to, to control? I can give you the ability to screen share. Awesome. Nicholas, you, uh, you can go ahead and screen share yourself if that works for you. That's perfect. Right. Go ahead and okay. Um, I, I believe you all can uh, see my screen at this point. Is that correct? Yes. Awesome. All right. Uh, well, first off, thank you so much for allowing me to present to you all uh, today. Uh, I have uh, spoken with you all in the past about this project, but I have to say we are at such an exciting part and an exciting point in this project. Um, as you all may recall, this project uh, has a long history, and it started nine years ago in 2014 when the Parks Department assessed the condition of flood parks amenities. And uh, what we determined at the time was due to uh, their condition, the park really needed a comprehensive overhaul. Uh, currently, the baseball field, tennis courts, softball field are all unusable given their condition. Uh, the playground is out of date. And uh, overall, the park lacks some of the modern amenities that people really want when they go to a park. And so uh, that's what launched at the time what was called the uh, Reimagined Flood Park Project. Um, and we, uh, in recent time, have evolved that from the Reimagined to the Realize. And, and um, I think one of the things that is exciting about this project is the iter iterative process it's taken. So uh, here you'll see three iterations of the landscape plan. Uh, the one on the furthest right was approved by the Board of Supervisors in 2020 uh, at the same time that they certified the project's environmental impact report. And uh, while the project has taken many forms over the years, it's always maintained the same five goals, which was to promote healthy lifestyles, to preserve existing trees, to incorporate innovative technologies, uh, create community gathering spaces, and to expand types of uses. Uh, in 2021, the department hired uh, its landscape architect for the project, CMG Landscape Architects, uh, who uh, I do just want to say has been doing a remarkable job, uh, and you'll see some of their work uh, later in the presentation. Uh, and while the project had been underway for several years at that point, uh, we started receiving more feedback from a, a subset of the, of the community that was not as heavily engaged in the project in earlier phases. And that was the, the portion of the community that was really focused on preserving the, um, uh, the more mature trees and really that oak woodland component of the project. Uh, and so we decided at that point in time that we would go back and re-engage with the public. And so we held a uh, community, a virtual community workshop. Uh, and this was all, you know, fairly early in COVID. Uh, so we held a, a virtual workshop. We held uh, two pop-up events, including one in the park. And we circulated an online survey. And using this information, uh, we made a pretty comprehensive revisions to the landscape plan. Uh, so nearly 800 individuals filled out the survey, uh, and, and uh, in the interest of time, I will highlight five of the 18 questions that we asked, but I'm happy to send Sean the, uh, the link to the survey results, so if you're interested, you can see all of them. Uh, but a key piece of information gathered from the surveys was that people value that uh, people value the natural environment of the park as much as they're excited to use the built features uh, of the park. And, um, and you can see that with 63% uh, 
saying that they're most excited about uh, the natural areas. Um, we also noticed that while people are excited for uh, the recreational elements of the project, so the sport fields, the playgrounds, the pump track, tennis and pickleball courts, and the basketball courts, 60% uh, of the respondents are really excited about the picnic areas. And for us, it was really clear that uh, these picnic sites, these reservation sites are core and key to how people use Flood Park and always have. We've known for a very long time that Flood Park is a popular place for families to host birthday parties and family reunions and christenings and, and, and other types of gatherings. And so um, we, we heard that loud and clear. And I think, you know, while, while it's uh, made very evident that, you know, 60% of the people identify the picnic sites as that amenity they're most excited to use, 83% say uh, survey respondents indicated that they will use the picnic site. So even if you're not most excited about the picnic sites, you're still planning on using it. And so uh, for us, that was a really important uh, piece of information for us to really retain because uh, as I'll talk about later, it allowed us to really scope what we consider to be a informative uh, phase one of construction. Uh, most people are looking forward to using Flood Park to exercise and be in nature, to gather with family and friends, uh, or just to let kids play and have fun. And over two thirds of people fall into to these types of categories. So for us, this means how do we provide these amenities as soon as possible? Uh, it's important, I think, to really state that we're estimating at this point in time, overall, the project will cost north of $30 million uh, just to construct. So that doesn't include all the planning, permitting, designing, construction, administration. We're talking about just construction costs. And uh, as a result, we're going to have to construct it in phases. So not every component of the landscape plan will get implemented in phase uh, in phase one and all at the same time. So we really had to look at this data and talk with the community to understand what does phase one need to consist of. Um, when one of the more talked about features of the landscape plan are the sport fields and uh, rightfully so, I do think they are uh, some of the bigger elements uh, and some that have drawn the most attention. And so when sizing uh, the fields, it was important for us to understand what size were wanted and needed the most. Uh, this is largely based on who will be using the fields and for what purposes. Youth sports have recommended field dimensions, uh, as, as you may be aware, and uh, they also have these minimum uh, size requirements for age groups. But likewise, the department always wanted to meet the really the two express needs for fields that we were always hearing. One of those express needs is that there's a need for more fields for organized sports, so Little League, AYSO, and the likes. Uh, but also there's a there's a need for fields just for drop-in space. So um, those are the two goals that we always wanted to uh, make sure that we were we were meeting and making sure we size the fields appropriately is one of the components of, of allowing us to do that. So what it means by sizing fields properly is that we could um, we could have one field that supports a single game, or we could have one field that gets divided in half and supports two games, uh, or we could have one field that gets divided in half and you could have an organized league on one field um, and drop and play on the other. And these are all the things that we're we're excited about providing and, and we're committed to providing because we hear from a lot of people in the community that when fields get over uh, subscribed, they get over uh, programmed, there's no place for drop and play. And that's something that we want to make sure we're, uh, we're not kind of uh, falling into with this project. Uh, earlier, I talked about the the contingency of residents who really wanted to uh, protect the oak woodland. And so um, I think it's important that I'm able to highlight that and, and 
give those residents uh, in that community the, the due credit that they deserve for really participating and making sure that their voices were heard. Um, and so this was really probably the driving force behind the revisions to the landscape plan was making sure that we protected the trees at the heart of the oak woodland, uh, which is like up, up against Bay Road on that southwest side of the park. And so, um, uh, and so as you'll see, I really think we were able to accomplish uh, a proper balancing of the project. Uh, so this is what the revised land, what we refer to as the revised landscape looks like. And so what we have done, uh, so using all the feedback received, the department revised the landscape plan. And we did this by relocating the multi-use sport field outside of the Oak Woodland uh, in order to preserve those trees. So the uh, the 2020 landscape plan had a field right here. And it was, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it was moved up uh, right here. So we were able to preserve all the trees in what's referred to as the heart of the Oak Woodland. Uh, and we were able to group uh, like amenities in the northern segment of the park. So we have that, that smaller multi-use field adjacent to the larger multi-use field, uh, as well as up by the pump track. One of the great things we were able to do as well is we were able to repurpose areas that are already impacted by built features. We were able to repurpose those so we could reduce our impact on resources. So for example, uh, the tennis pickleball court will be located where the existing sand volleyball court is located right now. The basketball court will be located where an existing reservation area is. The sand volleyball court will be located where an existing sand volleyball court is located. So we were able to um, reuse these areas so we didn't have to remove more trees and we were able to reduce our impact on the overall resources in the park. Um, and that is a process that we're very proud of because we were able to significantly reduce the number of trees and that we were uh, removing. And what we've actually been able to do is um, put a great a, a greater level of um, focus of the removed trees. They're now non-native trees, they're smaller trees, they're unhealthier trees. So um, so we've been able to really protect the large, mature native species that provide so much value to the local ecosystem. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit about phase one, uh, which is where we're at right now with this project. So based on the feedback we received during the public engagement process, those five overarching goals that I talked about earlier, logistics regarding design and construction and available funds, the department scope phase one to include the multi-use sport field, the new picnic and reservation areas, pump track, tennis pickleball courts, basketball courts, sand volleyball courts, uh, walking paths. Uh, we are making improvements to the back side of the parking lot to improve ingress and egress. Uh, and we're also going to be installing the subsurface utilities. Uh, as part of phase one, we'll also be removing non-functioning restrooms. So by scoping phase one this way, we're able to provide four new recreational features that are not currently there. We're able to rehabilitate two features um, that currently are unusable due to their poor condition. Uh, and we're able to provide uh, new picnic and reservation areas and walking paths for people. Uh, overall, we are estimating that Phase one is going to cost approximately $15.5 million to construct, um, and that does not include the uh, construction administration and oversight. Um, and I want to highlight something that we're really excited about, which uh, for us, the multi-use field that will be installed at Flood Park will be the first multi-use field in the San Mateo County Park system. We do not have a field like this anywhere else in our system. And uh, here's the, the proposed layout or the layout that we're designing to. And we came to this layout based on uh, conversations with uh, youth sport advocates, with youth sport leagues to make sure that we're maximizing the usability 
and uh, serviceability of the of the field. And so, uh, as you can see, when the field is used uh, in its entirety, which is the white outline, uh, it can be used as a U12 soccer field. But when divided in half, which are shown in those yellow lines, uh, you can get two U10 fields. Uh, this versatility is critical for the department, as we've always committed to what I spoke about earlier, which is meeting those two needs of programming space and drop-in space. So this field layout allows us to really accomplish that. Uh, we could host one game on the entire field. We could host a game on the U12, U10 field and align that second field to be used for drop-in, or we could use we could host two U10 uh, games concurrently. So uh, really something that well, actually, and, and and one thing that we've even talked about is is coning this into four fields, and they could all be used for drop-in. So um, these are just the ways that we want to be utilizing the field. And something that is always important to us as we've gone through this project for nine years is the community in North Fair Oaks. And we have heard from the community time and time again that they do not have access to parks. So whereas other communities have multiple parks to pick from, uh, there are actually no parks. Uh, there's one park within North Fair Oaks proper, and there are no public sports fields within North Fair Oaks proper. And many residents of this community rely on Flood Park as the local park. And so for us, making sure that we're not over-programming the field and making sure that there's drop-in space available is something that um, we've committed to for many years and uh, we're very excited about seeing that through. Uh, this is not a picture of what the pump track will look like at Flood Park, but it is a, the approximate size. And uh, so in May or June of this year, the department will be hosting a community workshop to solicit feedback on what bikers, skaters, and scooter riders would like to see in the pump track. Uh, there are many aspects of the project that will be determined during that public engagement process. But a few things we know at this point are the track will be asphalt so as to maintain its quality and extend its useful life. Uh, it'll also be, uh, by being asphalt, it's a facility that can be used, uh, as I kind of alluded to earlier, people on bikes, people on skateboards, people on scooters, people on rollerblades. Um, and something that's really important to us and that we made a requirement of the last pump track we built was uh, it has to be rideable by people of all ages and abilities. So we don't want a pump track that uh, people are bored with after two weeks, but we also don't want a pump track that only the best of the best can ride. Um, and so that's uh, uh, those are criteria that we are gonna hold the designer to and that we will uh, be discussing with the community. And we're very excited though about this project. This, to our knowledge, is gonna be the first paved pump track on public lands in San Mateo County. Uh, it will be our second pump track in the system, but the first that is paved. And, um, uh, and so we're right now uh, in the process of developing the bid documents so we can solicit proposals uh, from qualified firms. Once we select one, we'll make that firm known to the public uh, and then again, we will go ahead and advertise the uh, community workshops um, so we can start engaging with the users of the pump track. And this is something that we are really excited. You know, this is something, if you go to these pump tracks anywhere, you see a broad range of users. You will see people of all ages, people of all interests using these. And so that's what we're really excited about is hearing from these, the, the potential users essentially, of what it is they wanna see. Uh, I, I talked about picnic sites earlier. Uh, wanna highlight that we have always committed, we're gonna maintain the existing number and quantity of picnic sites, uh, both reservation and drop-in in the park. And uh, this plan, this layout pro uh, proposal does that. So the red circles are uh, reservation sites or so larger sites that have to be reserved ahead of time. The green circles, are the drop-in sites. So those sites that you can just grab and, and use uh, at first availability. And the sites with the letter E in them show that, uh, show sites that are gonna essentially be rebuilt at their existing location. So uh, there's a number of them along Bay Road and then uh, adjacent to residents on Del Norte. And, uh, but one of the things we wanted to be very 
conscientious about was not putting a lot of new amenities up against neighbor uh, neighbors' fences. We actually moved. We had originally a couple additional lo uh, locations closer to the residents, and we ended up moving those. Um, so I think we've done a really good job of balancing uh, providing great recreational opportunities while uh, being a good neighbor. Uh, so we talked a little bit about picnic sites, um, and I have been asked a lot of questions as to why the picnic sites are included in phase one, and I thought this was a fitting way to end the presentation today. So these are the picnic sites uh, as they are right now, uh, and you all uh, have been briefed uh, by me on the um, uh, on the uh, desire of having uh, those picnic sites and how excited people are. And so I wanted to share with you a preview of what the new sites are going to um, approximately look like. Uh, and so this is what we're aiming for. Uh, so we have longer communal tables. We have actually designed the sites in a way that can be divided in two. So let's say this is a site that could hold 100 people. Um, two groups of 50 could use this just as well, uh, or a group of 100 could use this. Really excited. You'll see at the bottom left um, that, sing that smaller table. That's actually a youth table. So something that we have uh, included in our designs are tables designed specifically for kids. And um, we've made sure that all of our sites um, are uh, going to really what I would consider to be above and beyond what typical park standards are to make sure that our tables are accommodating of, um, of people of all abilities. Um, and so people with wheelchairs will have uh, just as much access to both the barbecues as well as the tables as anyone else. And, uh, and we also have youth tables that are wheelchair accessible as well. Uh, here's another, uh, another site uh, that, uh, that will be in the park. And something that we're really excited about is adding those Adirondack chairs uh, with those, uh, with those uh, the, the pads of stone. So recognizing that not everyone's going to want to be sitting in the uh, in the picnic tables, but that they're still going to be part of the group and still want to be part of the activity. So we've added that and uh, a number of sites will have a, a number of those chairs. Some of them will come with four chairs, some will be with six. Um, but we thought that that was really a, a cool thing to do. And it really makes the, the sites unique. And then here's what the grills are going to look like. So right now, a lot of those grills are old, they're rusted, um, and we're going to pull those out and we're going to be bringing in these new, uh, these new grills that have uh, both serving and prep stations in them, as well as for our larger sites, we'll have uh, sinks. And, um, and, and so that's our picnic sites, which I, I think are really going to be one of the highlights of the park. So when we talk about schedule, you know, so so what's next? Uh, I guess is probably the question that a lot of people are going to want to know. So, in December uh, of 2022, the Board of Supervisors approved the Phase One plan uh, that I just walked you through, and authorized the Department of Public Works to finish preparing 100% plans and go out to bid and advertise the bid. So we are, I would say, at the 99% design plans. We're just buttoning up some of the smaller details. Um, for everything that was in phase one, except for the pump track. And that's going to go through its own parallel process. And the reason for that is because pump track design and build is still a specialty. Uh, it's not something that most general contractors are able to do. So we're bringing in special uh, a special firm. Uh, who that firm is, there's a couple out there, so we don't know who it will be yet. Um, but Whoever does this will have to have had uh, extensive experience designing and building these. So we will be hopefully breaking ground in uh, June or July of this year. Uh, construction is estimated to take between nine and 12 months. And, um, uh, and as we're going through that initial construction phase, we'll be finalizing our design for the pump for the pump track and uh, pump track will be built at the same time. So everything should be done summer of 2024. Um, so that is uh, 
kind of what's what's before you today. And and with that said, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions you may have. Well, that that was terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very comprehensive. I I all of a sudden I want to get on a pump track. Okay. <laughs> and I, I'll bring I'll bring you to the next time I go out to one. Sounds good. A Ashley, do we do we have any public comment? At this time, if you'd like to make a public comment on this item, please bring a comment card for it. Um, if you're on Zoom, you can notify staff by using the raise hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're dialing in, you can use star nine to engage the raise hand function. I have no comment cards. And I'm seeing no hands raised. So, so that you did a great job. I, I'd like to ask if there's any questions from the Joint Commission for Mr. Calderon or any further discussion for the for the Joint Commission. Oh, sorry, I didn't I didn't see that there was a question actually. Go ahead, Jennifer. Uh, Nicholas, thank you so much um, for that presentation. Uh, really blown away by um, the improvements and and your hard work, and obviously reaching out to the community and uh, discovering what's important to them. Um, a couple of questions for you, just from um, <clears throat> some community members who have asked me about uh, this, and I was hoping that they would. I always try to encourage people to come in and public comments speak. I know they end up sending you emails or people or staff emails, but I really do uh, encourage people to come and, and speak and give public comment. Um, I believe the um, lacrosse group, the Menlo Atherton Grizzlies reached out about um, field lines on the field um, and hearing your presentation um, and hearing that you did you know, you're drawing a fine balance between programming that field and giving time to open, you know, uh, drop in play. Um, is there any reason why, you know, what is the thought there behind not putting the lines down? Because, you know, as, as time goes on, maybe you wouldn't schedule um, lacrosse play right in the beginning because you feel like you have a number of user groups, but as you kind of see where there's openings and they can be fit in, uh, why wouldn't that be part of the of the planned lines to start? I guess my first part of the question. Yeah, uh, and that's a great question. We actually did not hear from the lacrosse group during this process. Um, the lacrosse, you know, there might have been a, a a one comment here or one comment there, but you know, when we look at eight hundred comments, we have to look at the the over you know the overarching themes, and so uh, we we're not able to obviously. Uh, provide everything that that people bring up but overall the, the lacrosse community did not show up uh didn't show up to the workshops didn't show up to the online surveys um and so it was never really part of the conversation interesting and um just quick question the online surveys and and any of these um info sessions i pro i believe did go out to you know a wide range of user groups and and was out there so not not um, so that's great feedback for me to take back to, you know, the user group that did reach out to me. Um, and then I guess the, the other question I had is, um, and maybe I missed this in the presentation, are there any lights um, planned for the fields in certain parts of the park? Obviously, to be respectful of the neighbors, uh, I'm sure you place them, but are there lights as well? So there's extended use? There are. So there are no uh, lights that would support nighttime activity, right? We'll have some small pathway lighting. So as it starts getting dark, people are able to get back to their car safely. Um, but there will be no uh, sport lights, you know, lights to accommodate night games or practices or anything. Okay, great. Thank you. And sorry, look, one last question. Is that, um, is that uh, like a, a, a rule for the area or just something that came about from your feedback process? Yeah, so there was a lot of concern expressed by the neighbors about that. And so in an effort to be respectful, uh, that was not something we proposed. Okay, great. Thank you so much for clarifying. Thank you for all your work. Yeah, of course, thank you. And any other questions or comments from the commissioners? 
Okay. So if there's no other comments from the commissioners, I understand. Um, so thanks to Mr. Calderon for coming and, and talking to us about this really exciting project at Flood Park. Thank you for being here, Nicholas. Um, I know that the power outages have been, been impacting a lot of folks. So I'm glad you were still able to make it down here today. Thank you. Um, and for folks here, um, I know you're all familiar with Flood Park, or if you're not, um, you'll have the opportunity to come to Flood Park uh, when we have our annual egg hunt event, which is coming up on Saturday, April 8th at Flood Park. So you can kind of see what the before picture looks like before they start all this wonderful work. And we're partnering with San Mateo County Parks on that event. And again, that's Saturday, April 8th. Thank you. Oh, no, no problem. And, and I'm afraid based on our latest weather, they might want to bring uh, rain shoes. Um, anyway, um, I think we're up to section D of the meeting, um, which is our community campus proposed programming plan elements. Um, we're going to continue to D1, a study session on the proposed programming elements for the Menlo Park community campus. Library and Community Services Director Sean Reinhardt We'll begin this item, followed by Interim Assistant Library and Community Service Director Rondell Howard and LCS Supervisor Natalia Jones. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chair Cohen. And uh, again, yeah, and Natalia and Rondell will be joining me for this presentation. We're really excited about the Menlo Park Community Campus, and we're making preparations uh, to program the facility. Um, let's see here, I'm sure I'm on the right slide here. So um, these slides were included in the agenda packet, but we are gonna walk through them just to make sure that everybody um, kind of has a chance. We're gonna cover a little bit of ground here. And this is about the activities that will be happening in the new uh, community facility that's under construction right now. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about some guiding principles that um, around programming that facility as set forth by our city council. As well, um, there is a subcommittee of the city council, which we'll talk about in a minute, and a working group who really uh, contributed along with the commissions and the general public over the past several months um, into what the vision is for the programs in this new facility. And so we're going to talk about who the new facility is intended to serve, those guiding principles, those folks I just talked about. Um, we've already looked at the resident survey results quite extensively. They're here for reference, but we're not going to spend a ton of time on them in this presentation. Talk a little bit about current and potential programs in the new facility and then some important dates. So we've just got some pictures here. I think that screen seems to be coming up faster than the others. Here's what the site looked like when construction began. Um, just going to toggle through a couple of pictures here. As it was coming together, that was maybe around a year ago. And then I've got one more that I think was from about four or five months ago. That's even farther along than that. So it's this inspiring new landmark is rising before our eyes at 100 Terminal Avenue. So who the Menlo Park Community Campus, which is just a working group for the facility, who that will serve. Um, the programs and services in that new center will reflect and prioritize the people that it's being built for. Um, that's Menlo Park residents, and it's specifically Bellhaven residents, and in particular, it's longtime Bellhaven residents who relied heavily on the services in the previous center. Uh, furthermore, the new facility can and should serve these residents even more meaningfully and with even greater priority and with even more responsiveness, inclusion, and belonging than existed in the previous center. So that's who this facility is intended to serve, and that's how we're planning. Um, to carry that out. Um, just quickly, the City Council has set forth a number of guiding principles that apply to um, our programs in general, but these are also helping us to guide this new facility, and they're really centered around the fair, just, and equitable management of all the institutions that serve the public either directly or by contract, and distributing those public services in a fair, just, and equitable manner and committed to promoting inclusion, fairness, justice, and equity in our policies and the programs that we provide to the community, as well as ensuring that we're creating a healthy environment, nutritional options, and city programs. So this is really kind of the vision, the guiding principles. I mentioned that the city council created a subcommittee that's two city council members. It's currently Vice Mayor Taylor and city council member Nash um, to help advise the, the project as it goes forward. 
Um, they created a working group of Menlo Park residents. I think all, almost all of them are actually Bell Haven residents um, to support and advise the subcommittee's work. Um, city staff of Del Natalia and myself have met with the subcommittee and working group. I see a couple of members of the working group in the audience right now, actually, that's all over here. Um, met with them several times over the past several months. So a lot of what you're going to see for the programming plan really kind of comes from those conversations. In addition to feedback, we've also received from the commission and the general public. And uh, it would not be a presentation about the new facility without this wonderful rendering. And about a year from now, we will see the real thing. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Natalia to talk about the working groups. Feedback. Okay, so um, the working group, they wanted a new, different, and a fresh approach to how to what's operated at the new NPC scene. There was a desire to have local hiring, so people from the community, um, preference for people that live in Bellhaven um, in Minimal Park. Also to review the programming and budget and operations budget. Um, the way to do that was to start with um, the current activities that we have and activities that we had previously, and also the activities that other community centers and other um, areas, other communities have. And then putting specific outreach to people that don't have access to technology, to the computer on a regular basis, or to those that, speak, that are Spanish speakers. So making sure that they are involved as well. And then also to provide recognition or awards to people in the community who have helped with creating the vision of dialogue for Okay, so additional um, operational ideas. I'm um, making sure there was a front desk that provided information and resources and assistance of um, things going on in the community for people to work. Stays clean and safe. Um, also, deciding what to to do with the maker space and what to do with the library. Um, having rules that are posted that people know what they can and cannot do. If you have to supervise children or certain noise levels or certain standards you want people to, to follow. Um, also the field usage policy. Um, having priority use of Kelly Field and also um, for the tennis sports for the neighborhood. And then just having a free a fee structure um, so that Everyone can attend and participate in the programs that are offered. So, Uh, so determining what to use that space. And then so continue with the library makers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so these are some ideas, some programming ideas that we came up with that can take place, that can take place in the library and maker space. There's story time, tutoring, there's some uh, hours that the librarians can help and people can develop skills. Um, having some uh, child or adult teen book clubs, um, learning teens learning how to play instruments or learning music, discussing music together. And then space. And then in the athletic facility, some program ideas that the working group came up with was strength training for women, strength training and balance training for seniors. 
um, gymnastic classes for kids with special needs. In the fitness center, we wanted it to be safe. We wanted it to have newer state-of-the-art equipment, roomy, much bigger than it was, um, the team fitness area. We wanted uh, teams with disabilities to also be able to participate and then just having a movement studio as well with exercise and part. And then for the aquatics area, additional work on it. Ideas having adaptive swimming for people with disabilities, allowing the seniors to have exercise classes in the pool. We want to make sure there's plenty of free swim time for the residents to come in. The pool will be heated. And then just having infant and topper activity support. So we just want to educational opportunities, um, new classes that we're thinking of or that we're working with, thinking of coding, engineering, science classes, health and nutritious class, nutrition classes, basic life skills, how to manage money, helping people dress for interviews, actually develop interview skills writing resumes, possible college programming, driving schools, and then to also have a computer lab. Yeah. So those are just some of the programming metrics that we're working with the for the pieces. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and additional <laughs> educational opportunities. Um, Environmental education and impacts, so storyboards, uh, classes based on sustainability, some bike repair stations. We have an organization, Live in Peace Now, that, that teaches children how to, how to fix bikes. Um, so we have classes like that, cooking classes, gardening classes, uh, mixed, mixed media or body fitness. Right. Well, thank Better. you. Oh, yeah. That's what the program yeah, is. So, so, so we have a little bit of lag time with some of the screens. So sorry about that. Um, so so this really is the, the core of the plan, how we are preparing to program that facility. It's not everything, but I think Natalia just did an excellent job really showing and talking about what we're going to be focusing on. Um, area of the building, the children's um, Library garden um, up above is the, um, the library space. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the community survey results because the commissions have reviewed them before, as has the city council. Uh, we did resident survey in summer of last year that had over 900 responses from residents. Now those complete results um, uh, have been have been discussed quite a bit, and also inform this. I think the, the main takeaways from the survey results really were um, to prioritize the, the program elements that, um, that folks rated with the highest importance and it dovetails really well with what Natalia just kind of walked through. And also to include some programs that we aren't currently offering um, on a regular basis, but that are really important, like homework help for children and teens after school, um, job skills, job readiness, job security resources, school security advice, healthcare navigation, social services. Those are all things that we're going to bring new to this building or, or in, a, in a bigger way than before. Um, also to prioritize programs and classes that are free or steeply discounted for residents. Um, and to deprioritize, not completely eliminate necessarily, but deprioritize programs that are primarily attracting folks from outside of, of, of Yamal Park. Uh, or the survey respondents rated as the most important. The opportunities for children and families. So you know, you just can show up and do an activity. It doesn't have to be um, planned in advance necessarily. And then aquatics is kind of its own full track of the city council. I think with Thank that, you. I'll turn to Rondell to talk about um, like some of the current programs that we're offering 
and how that will kind of transition into programs in the new center. Thank you, Sean. So, um, sorry for the lag, everybody, but as of right now, I'll just kind of be ran right now within our division. So, uh, recreation and sports, the current programs that are that are actually being ran, um, are some of our instructional classes that that we have. Uh, we have youth classes, summer camps, adult classes, youth sports camps. Um, and within all that, you, you get um, dance, STEM, enrichment, sports, um, summer camps, you, you get uh, some coding classes, dance expressions, uh, you get basketball, you get, foot, you get football, you get hockey. And then for our adult instructors, Athletic fields um, that consist of soccer, lacrosse, uh, multi use baseball, softball. Uh, we have gymnasium. Uh, right now, we only have two at the moment two full court basketball. Um, once that new building is up, we'll definitely have another court added. Uh, we have three volleyball courts. Uh, we have a whole host of picnic areas um, and green spaces. Uh, tennis courts, we have 13 throughout the city to our size. Uh, Two of the tennis courts in size for dual use for pickleball. Um, so, so that makes eight total pickleball courts in, uh, in all. Um, and then as far as sports and recreation, um, our current our current programs in athletics, uh, we do have a youth. Um, so programs can consist of instructional classes, leads, drop in play, um, some aquatic, some aquatic uh, programs, uh, fitness. Um, we have a uh, space that, that can be programmed as far as the, gym, the gymnasium. Um, I think that this space will also be that fitness center, um, the movement center as well. Again, you can, you can uh, until our new uh, event hall, our kitchen area. So that's another program space and then as far as uh reservations our facility rentals we can do things with our prep kitchen our flex classroom uh, our conference room maker space and maybe and things of that nature um moving on to our next entity which is the senior uh, our senior program uh, some of the current programs is being ran there is our food bank uh second harvest food bank program we have our senior lunch program uh, our door-to-door -door transportation as well um, moving forward, some of the other programs that we do have is arts and craft, um, some dancing, yoga, meditation, mind exercises, um, games, technology, uh, a host of host of activities that happen there. Um, again, moving on with some of the uh, current. Events within the Singer Center. And celebrating uh, holiday luncheons to Thanksgiving uh, to Black History Month, Chinese New Year's, all of you as well. Um, and again, with some of those partnerships in order to run those programs.
Well, thank you, yeah. uh, Rondell and Natalia. Um, here, here's a nice view of what the Senior Center Terrace uh, will look like in the evening. We're excited about that. Uh, looks like there's a little bit more. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, we just wanted to take a break to kind of look at look at what the uh, outside of the Senior Center will look like. But moving forward, uh, we also have our youth, our youth center, the Bellhaven After School Program. Um, the current programs that are being ran out of there are um, it serves our can it serves kindergarten group and um, there's an after school program and we have a transportation system for the kids. Um, with that, when we get to our summer our summer youth uh, programs, we have our camp Milo, uh, we have our mental camp, which is our, our service in summer. Then we also have a Beachwood summer camp because Beachwood is a, a year round. Um, school, so we, we try to make sure that we accommodate them as much as possible. Um, for some of the current programs um, that we're doing, uh, so one of the things that it provides for families is a safe and healthy caring and learning environment so everybody can go to work and understand that their kids are safe and happy. Um, but some of the daily activities consist of arts and crafts, um, homework assistance, summer reading, uh, STEM activities, team building. All of the above. Um, potential programming um, that can help settle in um, right now is, is continuing with the after school development programs, um, developing uh, a more extensive youth, uh, summer youth program, um, as well as the summer service. Um, one of the things of potential um, with the programming is. Um, assisting kids to classes um, that's offered in other areas within the MPCC building. So if there's, say, um, a karate class happening or there's a bike building program that will have the capability to kind of escort the kids there, get them there, get them back in a safe, in a safe environment. Um, then we'll move on to the library, which is, which is another, another entity of the new building. Um, so as of now, some of the current programming that's happening is that you can have technology access, um, electronic book services, um, books by mail, story time, um, book groups, um, English uh, language conversation clubs. So a host of uh, programs that's, that's happening there. And so with the potential of the MPCC, this program that can be enhanced in the children's room, um, our homework center, uh, team space, um, upstairs, all ages library space, um, also, browsing collections, so focused on neighborhood access and, and availability is uh, something that can be that can be um, kind of dialed in on. And then library, uh, library books and media collections that's tailored to the Bellhaven needs, which is which is a, a huge component. All right, um, thanks, Rondell and Natalia. And I think I'm just going to wrap up with some important dates in the process of doing the program plan. So. Um, obviously, we're here tonight to talk about where we, where we stand with the programming plan. We'd love to hear folks' feedback on that tonight. Then on April 4th, we're going to do um, a review with the City Council of these program plan elements. Um, April 26th, we'd like to propose another joint meeting of the Parks and Recreation Commission and the Library Commission. That's the fourth Wednesday um, to uh, dive in a little more deeply on these program plan elements and also to start to dive in on some of the facility use policies. We've heard about questions about, well, you know, how do you prioritize residents or neighborhood residents? And how, how do you determine who uses the field and how do you determine the classes are offered over the course of the year? And uh, like that neighborhood prioritization policy, things like that. Um, then coming back to the city council on May 4th with a preliminary staffing operations and programming plan not a proposal yet, but like considerations. Here's some of the staff we're thinking. Here's the different programs. So that the, the, it's starting to get like more uh, firmed up with some dollar amounts and some staff members attached to it. That will be May 4th. Um, then uh, May 15th, I think the two commissions will kind of do separate meetings that month. Uh, for the library commission, we really zero in on um, the, the library center, major space, teen zone, senior center, and social services elements of the programming plan. And then that same month at the Parks and Recreation Commission's regular meeting uh, for that commission to really focus in on the gymnasium, the aquatic center, the recreation programs, the facility rentals, the athletic field, which is held part, part of this project of Circuit Store, um, and outdoor racket sports, so that would include obviously football tennis. 
Um, and then in June, on a date to be determined, the city council is going to have their uh, budget workshop for the city's entire fiscal year budget for the new fiscal year. This plan would be a key component of that. So that's when we would actually propose the, the budget uh, from our department with some from Public Works uh, for operating and maintaining the new facility. And um, city council is scheduled to um, authorize the final budget on June 27. So that's kind of the timeline that we're looking at here. Um, all those dates you know, are subject to change, but this is a pretty good guideline here. Uh, I did want to note that this list doesn't include meetings that may take place from the, in the subcommittee of the city council because those are kind of ad hoc. And there's also a kind of ongoing monthly um, convening of the subcommittee with that working group of residents. Those aren't shown here, but those are happening um, as well. And so I think that that we completed the present. And then we're really looking forward to hearing from um, anyone's feedback. Thank you. Great. I, you know, I, I had heard um, when influencers break the internet, but we actually accomplished that tonight um, with just the plethora of activities that we're currently doing. So very impressive. Um, I wanted to thank Sean and, and uh, Natalia and, and Rondell. Very nice presentation, really important. Uh, Ashley, do we have any public comments? Yep. Okay. If your phone number ends in 0494 and you'd like to make a comment, please go ahead and state your name, unmute your device. Yes, uh, uh, that's me, I think. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, can I be heard? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, oh okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not there in person. Uh, I'm in Sacramento. I'm calling from Sacramento, and uh, my name is David Wheaton. Um, and um, I'm I'm very impressed with the plan. I I went over the plan several times, and uh, there's a lot of reasons why I have an interest in what's going on in Menlo Park. Um, I uh, grew up a part of my life, uh, my young life in Menlo Park. Um, um, I've been around uh, the peninsula area. Ha I had been around the peninsula area most of my life. Um, my parents moved to uh, Menlo Park on Hollyburn in the Belhaven area. And, and uh, I think it was 1952, 53, somewhere around there. Um, and I also uh, worked at Menlo Park. I was uh, assistant city manager. Um, slash community services director slash parks and rec director city clerk at one time i ran the engineering department at one time uh, i think i did pretty much everything there uh also interim uh, city manager uh for close to a year as well as um um uh almost uh, being appointed police chief at one point, which I uh, declined to do. 
Uh, but nonetheless, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on on some of the things that you've talked about. Uh, as far as the need assessment in, in, in Bellhaven, uh, we had done that. Uh, we had done one um, many, many years ago uh, while I was there under uh, my leadership and my team. We conducted um, one and uh, made some changes to uh, some of the activities that were occurring in, in Bell Haven. Um, and I just wanted to make one comment uh, because I didn't hear and I didn't read in the report, and excuse me if I missed it, but one of the things that was important uh, in doing the needs assessment that we discovered uh, was health care and uh, the access to health care. And of course, during that time, uh, when um, uh, certainly way before uh, Obamacare was available, and um, it was a it was a major issue that people had no access to medical care. Now there was Drew communities uh, community uh, facilities in East Palo Alto, in which uh, some residents in Bell Haven uh, were taken ad uh, advantage of at some point. But most people from Bell Haven that had to have uh, medical care had to go all the way to San Mateo. And so at the time they were taking the bus and doing those kinds of things. And so I didn't see that in your report. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, how we responded to that need was uh, we collaborated many things that we did uh, in collaboration. For instance, uh, uh, the Bellhaven Library is a collaboration of what we did uh, with the Ravenwood School District. Um, but um, the we collaborated with San Mateo County to put a clinic over at Bell Haven, and I don't know if you were aware of that, but it was a very popular clinic. In fact, uh, uh, we our measurements um, in which we calculated, and we thought that it would probably we would probably serve about 1,200 people uh, the first year, second year. You know, we probably serve about 1,500, and we quadrupled those numbers uh, in the first five years of service. And um, I, by the time I left, I, I had heard rumors that uh, the county was uh, about to close it because the deal was that we would build a clinic, in which we did. Um, it was the only city-run and owned medical clinic in California, There's on, there were only, I'm sorry, there were only three others, uh, Long Beach, City of San Francisco, um, and there was one other uh, community uh, city that actually had a medical clinic that they were responsible for and own. We had the fourth one, and um, we uh, did that in collaboration. It was very popular, very useful to the community, and because uh, we uh, were right, we took a part of the senior center at the time and chopped off a piece of that to accommodate the medical clinic. Um, but the people that would come there for the lunch program took full advantage of that medical clinic. They were getting uh, um, some of their... Um, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals ordered through there. They were getting uh, checkups, physical checkups. Uh, there was a baby clinic there, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm, I think, and I, at least I heard so, rumor that since I I left, they, yes, yes, yes. So, so, Mr. Wheaton, um, yeah. There, there was a, there's a timer on this, and it's, it's, the connection hasn't been great, so we let it run quite a bit longer. But it, I think what's intended here is a three-minute comment. So, if oh, I, if okay. I understood I would... you correctly, it's not your fault because you couldn't see the timer because the internet, we broke the internet tonight <laughs> apparently. Um, but, but I, I think your point's well taken. It's been documented okay. and heard. But, but, but the, 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 certainly, let me let me just I, I'll close real quickly. Uh, the, the the main reason why I called is the name of the Oneta Harris Center, 
And uh, I know that there's deliberations going on. You're looking at policies. Uh, and I just want to say that uh, it's very important and it's very important to a large segment of the communities in that area that that name remains at some point, somehow, some way. And, and I just wanted to get that in uh, being the most important part and reason why I called. Okay. Th thank you so much, Mr. Wheaton. Um, I think we're going to, we're going to stop the system for a second to see if we can do an internet reset so that the remainder of the meeting for people that are remote, as well as out of the respective people who made the trip here can actually hear and see. So if, if we we'll just pause for maybe a minute or two. We'll call yeah. a five minute recess. Five minute recess. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your time.
about being in the library, we have plenty of props for the. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's no, we're good right there. Why is it tilting? You see that? Yeah. That, uh, yeah. I'm assuming this has some kind of auto. It does have a key still. It's not yeah. 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 It does. Yeah. Like, like I said, picture <laughs> hanging. And then you can follow me. It looks like it's, it's a little more, it's more responsive. But you can see the lag is a lot less. You know. Yeah, I think it's going to actually is a lot of lag. Okay. So if you want to get like a couple of 50 to it. Yes, I put the note. <laughs> I put the note in. Right. All right. All right. I think we're good. Fascinating. Oh, look at this. After this item, we're going to go to F2 and then roll back. Yeah, we'll be good. So I think we're, we're going to resume the meeting. Our apologies for the five-minute recess. We believe we've got the technology working again. Please. So the owl has landed. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Okay, good. So, as I was saying, our apologies for those of you uh, dialing in at home and, and out of courtesy to the people who are kind enough to come here and be here live. 
I think we have our technology under control, but hey, we live in Silicon Valley, so you never know on a rainy night what's gonna happen. I believe there's one more person that has been patiently, and thank you for being so patient, waiting to uh, give their comments. I'm gonna hand it over to Ashley, thank you. Yes, thank you. We actually have two commenters who are going into talk. Um, and Malcolm, if you're able to hear us. Malcolm? Malcolm, if you're able to hear us, you have, you have the floor for three minutes. Can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me. <laughs> okay, so you can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. So Malcolm Harris, uh, I am uh, happy to be here tonight, and I'm happy to hear this, uh, and it's interesting to hear the plans for the Menlo Park Community Center and the piece, um, especially focusing on Bell Haven. Um, I also appreciate the fact that um, I spent pretty much every summer of my life, I'm 55, um, because my family, both sides are from East Menlo Park, East Palo Alto. And this is the more than 55th anniversary of Nairobi College. And um, many of the women in, Black History Month, our in, in Women's History Month, like um, Charles Edward Fishman, um, Juanita Duncan, um, Onetta Mae Harris, and Lola Mae Young, or uh, Lufia Ali, have contributed to the history of this community along with many others. And um, I think it's an, an, and I wanted to raise the importance of that and the fact that many of the um, plans that are being laid out um, are a repeat of that history. Um, which um, is a history of the Nairobi College and the enrichment of the East Menlo Park and East Palo Alto community that are still impacted through years of segregation into one community and neighborhood. So I wanted to name the importance of that and the appreciation for the history of that and the importance of maintaining that history. And especially now more than ever. And um, also, as the grandson, the oldest grandson of Onetta May Harris, wanted to lift up the history of that and in her name and the names of all of those folks as we remember um, to build and maintain our communities. So, um, appreciate the efforts that are being made in the Bellhaven community and the tradition uh, and the importance of remembering that. Thanks. Thank you. And Hi, this is Carol Fan. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, okay, good. So I just wanted to I'll I'll keep my comments really brief. Um, as a parent of kids with um, at Hillview, the my kids really enjoy being on the tennis team. I had to wake up really early to be able to get my kids on the tennis team so that because uh, there was a cap on the number of kids that could even participate. And that made it really um, well. Anyway, there and I, as far as I understood, this is completely anecdotal. Um, the the whole um, I think it was like fifty some kids. That registration closed before noon, which made it really hard to to do that. That's why I woke up really early to be able to get them in. But I think there's a lot of interest. I really appreciate the fact that the kids can all um, practice at Neyland Park. Um, and that they can participate in a team sport because I think kids really could use, um, you know, the kind of social skills that you learn and the team building skills that you learn. Um, it really prepares them well for future endeavors um, in life. So thank you very much for, um, for keeping that open for our students. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.
two more comments. Um, if your phone number ends in one four eight two. If, if your phone number ends in one four eight two, please state your name. Sorry, this is Carol Fan again because I was I was realizing that I didn't think the Zoom was working for me. Thank you so much. Bye. Yasmeen, Yasmeen, if you can hear us. Yes, yes good. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Good evening, everyone. I hope that you can hear me. My name is Yasmeen Abdusami. Oakley and I'm calling behalf on behalf of as a community member. Um, I represent an organization called EPA for reparations where we teach about rep rep reparative justice and reparations. Um, I am calling as a community member tonight. I grew up in East Palo Alto and I went to Menlo Atherton High School. Um, so I used the Onetta Harris Center frequently growing up. Um, I'm an artist. So uh, the Onetta Harris was pivotal to my rearing and to a lot of us in East Palo Alto. Um, so tonight I'm calling to advocate that people from East Palo Alto can still use the services of the Onetta Harris Center after its completion. And I'm also calling to advocate for the community and the family to please do not rename the Onetta Harris Center. Um, as I've mentioned weeks before calling, um, I saw your presentation about the programs you intend to have and that, that's wonderful. But um, to be able to keep the name and the legacy that surrounds the Onetta Harris Center and the family and even greater Menlo Park history. Um, that would be amazing. So I really hope that um, that will happen. I really don't see the community, the, the council members advocating on behalf of the family or the community. And I would really like to know what you think and know what you're gonna do. Um, so thank you. I appreciate you and everybody have a good evening. Thank you. At this time, if there's no other public comment on this item, I will turn it back over to Mr. Hey, great, thank you. Th thanks for all those very uh, uh, informative and thoughtful comments. Um, is there any further, any questions from the Joint Commission for LCS, LCS staff and any further discussion for the Joint Commission at this time. If you have questions or comments, please. Here and on the phone. Yeah. Please. I have a question. Um, I love the presentation. I love hearing all the feedback. I'm interested to know um, what the city staff is doing in terms of putting together budgets for all of these ideas. And then when it's pitched to the city council, how does that actually work? So like maybe there's enough budget for everything, but if not, how do you take a look at all of these ideas and synthesize them with the outreach to the community that was separate from the working group and then come up with a strategy that covers as many of the bases as possible for, for both? I mean, I, I speak at the library commissioner, so I'm mainly interested in library things, but because it is a community center, obviously, we, we've we got a lot of different spaces that are multi-use. Anyway, that's what I want to know. So a uh, great question. Um, 
So the city is a service organization. You know, primarily what we do is deliver services to the community. And in order to do that, you know, the main uh, resource we have are the people who work for us. And so a, a big part of sort of the budget for operating the facility will be around the staffing. Um, so that'll be that'll be a key component of it. Um, now there are currently services being provided already with existing staff. For example, the Bellhaven Ranch Library is currently operating, and the new facility, you know, we're going to move to the new facility. So there's already staff for the, the library, and they'll just move over, basically. However, the new library will be a little bit bigger, have a few additional things that don't exist currently. So there may be a request for some additional staff capacity there. Now, similarly, the senior center is currently operating in temporary location and still in order. And there are some things that are not currently operating, like the gym rooms or the uh, pool. And so there definitely will need some staffing around that. So that's one piece. Another piece is really around the uh, ongoing maintenance of the facility. Fortunately, utility costs should be pretty low since this facility is solar powered, but there's still ongoing maintenance you know, for the facility. So that'll be part of the cost. And um, in addition, then there's you know, some of these other costs related to specific programs. And for example, we, uh, there's a number of programs here that you know someone is going to need to provide those programs, whether it's healthcare navigation or job seeker resources or what have you. And so the budget proposal would kind of include that. And some of those could be performed by city staff. Others, it's very common for us to bring in you know, expert, you know, instructors, experts in those fields, like on a contract basis. And so we'll be working through all of that as part of that federal budget proposal. Um, a few other things like the opening day type things, the city council did on uh, March 14th approve uh, uh, the budget to buy all the furniture for the facility. That's pretty much like a one-time thing to open it up. Although we do need to replace that over time. Um, another would be um, the, the books for the library collection. Um, there's equipment fitness center. So there's some of those one-time costs too. Um, so I hope that helps answer your question, uh, but it really is kind of built with those components. And as a follow-up, all the all the suggestions that have come out, all the things that are in the PowerPoint that seem like really amazing community services that we would all love to do. Is there anything in there that is not feasible at this point based on the way the center is designed and unused, or is all of it things that could potentially happen. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that's why we're so excited to be kind of at this point. Because for the past several months, you know, we've been taking all of this input and kind of cross-referencing it with you know what is so like for example in the maker space, uh, you know, the ceramics program is feasible because we did put a film room in there. Um but um and like a 3D printer is feasible because we, we can accommodate that. And someone wanted to do say bronze cast or welding, um, that's not really possible. And so that's why it's not really shown in the plan. So everything that you saw is- is a pump truck. Yeah. So everything you saw is totally feasible. And that's, that part's already been kind of worked through at this point. Okay, thank you. Thank you, great questions. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm very intrigued by this concept of prioritization. We've been talking about it for a while. You want to prioritize the, uh, the specific residents of that area. We want to prioritize the residents of Menlo Park. We had a call tonight from somebody in East Palo Alto. You said we'd be talking about that later. I'm just intrigued as to how that process may work. Or what, when we might get to that point. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're starting that conversation now. I think we, we know that that's a pretty clear kind of uh, vision for the facility. There's a few ways to do that. And in fact, we kind of do that now. Um, it's But it's primarily expressed through um, fees, right? So many of like okay. creation classes, there's a fee to participate and residents will pay a certain fee. And non-residents typically pay a fee about 30%. 35% more. So that's one way to kind of incentivize residents versus non residents. But there's, um, I think what we're hearing is a desire to maybe do more. And maybe it's not fees, maybe it's some other ways. 
um, to ensure that the residents kind of have the priority. I think what we heard and seen in the previous center is even with that key differential, um, there were a lot of I think, observations and concerns that um, folks who were really kind of coming in from points not far away and really kind of taking up a lot of the space in, in the center and, and not leaving as much space and programming for you know residents in the local area. So, you know, it seemed like maybe the key differential didn't quite get us there. So that's a good we talked about it. Probably in the to add to that. Yeah. And, then, and then what what is in terms of the prioritization of within residents, right? There are residents that live half a mile away. There are residents that live three miles away. Um, there are people that live across the street. But how do we go about prioritizing? There's been a lot of discussion about prioritizing those who specifically live in Bell Haven and don't want to be denied this. Opportunity. Yeah, great question. So there, there's one example that maybe is illustrative, and uh, the library commission uh, talked about this earlier this month. And so right now the plan is for all the books in the new uh, library, at least for a period of time, to be um, uh, not holdable, meaning you, you can't go on the computer and place a hold for them and then have them shipped out to another library which is currently how the system works in the library. Someone from San Mateo, from South San Francisco, can request one of our books to the computer, and then we'll actually ship it over to them. And uh, then it, it's there until it makes its way back to us. And so we're actually looking to have the, the new library at the new center. Um, the books cannot be requested that way. You have to physically go into the library and take them off the shelf. So, there's sort of a geographical prioritization there, which is you don't really need to just come into the building, which is, you know, kind of going to prioritize folks who are in the distance or, you know, or live within town or, or maybe nearby in town or off because it's not that far to come um, and kind of take the chance on, I'm just going to come and, and take this book off the shelf. And so I think that concept is probably transferable in some other areas, but that's the conversation we kind of just started. Any other questions from the group? Okay. We're gonna jump there. Uh, so uh, really grateful for the, the feedback. Um, and unless there's anything else. Uh, I think we want to jump. We want to jump there too. Okay. So um, for, for those of you following the agenda and the program because the technical issues that we had, and also I think out of respect of people that made the trip and are here or waiting on the phone for the portion of the meeting uh, denoted F2, this would be regarding some comments that were made in the last section as well on the Menlo Park Community Campus naming process timeline update. Um, I'm gonna hand this over to uh, Sean Reinhardt to provide a brief introduction to this item and then open it up for public comment. Uh, uh, thank you, um, uh, Chair Collin, and for hearing the agenda. I sort of folks who are here who want to make comments on this item. So, this is really just an informational update. Um, typically, we don't do a presentation to go along with informational updates. Really, the nature of this update is just to advise the commission that the city council did, um, you know, direct the staff to. Uh, to reschedule the naming process to later in the summer and fall so that the current focus could be on the NPCC programming. The staff report does include an updated timeline, which is basically to kind of reboot the process, if you will, um, in August. And um, that culminating, I'm sorry, in July, uh, in July, um, and then culminating in sometime in September, um, the city council making that final determination. Uh, and then the other update from this report is that the city council did formally adopt uh, revisions to the naming policy, which was the topic of discussion last month. And they, they basically adopted them as proposed with one a minor tweak to one of the policies that really just sort of emphasized the city council if you want to make the decision. That was in every iteration and just wanted to clarify the language of the report. 
And so all that's in there. I think I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. And I think we have a couple of public comments. So um, I'm going to ask you to and Ashley, do we have any public comment on this item? Yeah. At this time, if you'd like to make a public comment on this item, please bring a comment by phone. If you're on Zoom, please notify the staff liaison by using the race one feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're dialing in, you can use star nine to engage the race one feature. Um, Ray, Ashley, Okay, hello everybody. And thank you for your consideration. But I wanted to make a statement. There are two things that black people are sure to look forward to in America. One is betrayal and the other one is false promise. Now, There's already been a statement from back two years ago when um, the city council in the city of Middle Park came up against great opposition uh, opposing the name change of Oneta Harris, really soon. And now, again, we're here because it was a false promise. It was a betrayal. Is something that we've always looked forward to in America. There's no need to change that name. All you're doing is removing our history, Black history out of the Black community, removing our culture. It'll be the same thing that happened to, again, I say this, this First Nation people, they um, false promises. I uh, took the land from them and uh, obliterated their culture and made them extinct. Okay, so now, in what, a few years from now, if you remove Oneta Harris's name and our culture and our history from the community center, it'll be the same thing. Nobody will even know we were there. We have a substantial amount of. Um, Black residents that still reside here. Okay. And um, there's one thing we look forward to. We want to give you an exchange for our tax dollars, too. Okay. Um, nobody ever has to question that on the other side of the highway. The way I'm looking at this, it appears that we're dealing with racialized capitalism. Here comes a short history of Facebook as opposed to a long history of the Black community that's meaningless to the city. So the city wants to decide with Facebook to gain favor and uh, obliterate our history because it's meaningless. And um, I'm asking that, you know, you guys have some consideration. Why do we always have to protest? And there's almost never been a time where we didn't have to fight or protest or some kind of civil unrest materialized as a result of our rights being denied or us being denied as a people. It's, a, it's unconscionable that we have to still keep doing this stuff. I'm through. Thank you. Next is Wayne Owens. Thank you, Beth. Wayne And Sam Drake. Hello, I'm Sam Drake. I've resided in, excuse me, in Menlo Park since. 1956. So when I first moved here, um, it was predominantly white. And um, my, <clears throat> excuse me, my dad, um, one of his army buddies came down to the Belhaven area. And um, the guy said, hey, they, 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 I'm selling uh, homies to black folks down. It's an area, it's a park down there. 
that they're selling these mineral parts. They want the park. But uh, they're selling the houses. And so um, dad uh, got his $50 down payment and uh, $12,000. We still live with 509, 99. And, um, but growing up as a kid, we had a rich history in this Bell Haven community. Black, we played sports, we did all sorts of stuff. And um, we also have people that have done prominent things in the neighborhood. I coached at Phillips Brook School for 45 years. It's my last year. Um, and also, <clears throat> I don't know what's wrong with my voice. Also, um, um, I've worked, I've done part time work at uh, Menlo Park right here since. So um, we, um, when I was in high school, we had a program that a lady ran. Her name was Onetta Harris. And it was, a, uh, it, we got jobs. And she made sure that we went to work. Um, my job was at uh, Allstate, which is where all the venture capitalists are now. So uh, <laughs> uh, that was my job. But you had to dress up. You had to respect everybody. And um, she was hard on us. And um, it was a, it was a wonderful program. Also, um, we've had legacy in this community. Uh, we have a park, Carl Clark Park. Uh, we also have a uh, Hattie Bostic corridor, and so we want these names to stay. We don't want these names to just evaporate. As Greg was saying, we want these names to continue. So, whoever, uh, even even if it's uh, the senior center, whatever, just keep on that. Uh, Harris's name in our minds. We don't want to be like uh, what uh, Jada Pinkett, but, uh, take her name, by, you know, like Chris Rock says, you know, don't put your name. We want to keep on that as Harris's name in our minds. Thank you. Thank you. Second Barbara. Good evening, everyone. Daryl or Daryl? Okay. Uh, Kenneth Harris. Good evening. My name is Kenneth Harris, son of Meta Harris. We moved here in 1954. We were set on into the real estate business, over to the business, community. I stay in the business in my community. It's all about helping the community. It's very much there to be in the service. It was selfless. She went into the community. Initially, she went into the community. Person, person's name, Parker Green, 
Another also meets the criteria that you guys have is renaming criteria. Renaming criteria. She plays a compelling and significant role in this community because historically the city council named it after her by unanimous decision in 1983, July 14th, or July 17th, and I'm going by your reading standards as to why this name should be named. Because you need to have to name. That's what you need. When a person meets that criteria, why, why do you have to change the name? Or try to do cancel first. Just cancel that. It's not right. It's not right. It's a sick will for just honorable, thinking people. You know, and the Holy Spirit still lives. Still lives in all of us. Of course, you know. So I'm, I'm asking you, and I'm saying the same thing. Don't change the name. Don't change the name. There's money. I know people come with pockets full of money. The money is not the solution. They better think. We don't want this community to lose its spirit, its character. It's not the same community. Where he must put people treat on the other side, this side, too. You think this is all we can put home. And that spirit should be made. Please don't, don't change that. Now, I'll just give one more chance to anybody who's dialing in or is attending online. Um, we're taking calls for comments on item F2, the MPCC um, naming timeline. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. And, and thanks, everybody, for a really thoughtful, uh, informative, uh, useful comments. Do we have any comments from the Joint uh, Commission? Please, uh, uh, Chris. That was really helpful. I learned a lot of Um, Do we get information? I don't know, maybe I missed it. I just was just looking to see if we have information on what the rules for the are. I can feel that. So, in the staff report for Adam F2, in addition to the uh, updated timeline for the process, um, let's see, it's attached on A. Actually, does have the uh, updated naming policy as City Council adopted it on this month for the So, I uh, believe there were some references to that policy in the comments, and, and that's it's there at the top of the list. Good comments. What do you think about the process? It's going to maybe be open public comment. Sure, so please. Um, my name is Israel Harris, and I've been on the uh, I've been on the naming council of uh, the working group for like, the past three to four years. Uh, have a unique perspective in this. I have uh, had family. So my grandmother is Amanda Harris, but had family in with Palo Alto, which Palo Alto, different parts of New England part. And one thing I've noticed is that there's a I would say more of a fundamental lack of communication when it comes to processes. So. Might, oh, no, that's okay. But, but the thing is, is that when we have topics that are of this importance to the community, it's good to have that information uh, continuously so that those who are new to these meetings, they can quickly understand what's on the process, the work that's been done. And also to understand that it's, I think from, this, from the perspective of my grandmother is that it's still it's right for the greater good to understand what's it was truly the essence, like you know, what she wanted to bring to the community, with the understanding of different perspectives, so that everyone knows what is going on. A lot is a lot of frustration, I think, comes from not knowing where we are uh, in this process. And then things that are changed to, if we're going to move it out to having this process and having a name in the 6th September, what is our criteria going to be in September? 
Is it just going to be uh, a decision made by city council or are there five steps that come before we do that? Uh, what are those five steps? Are we going to ask the community what their thoughts are? Or are we going to say, would well, you like to have the name say the same? Would you like to have it be a different name? Or are we just going to make it big? We don't know. That I would assume and everyone else is going to assume, whether you're in the group or not, that uh, there's no choice in the matter. Right? So the more information, the better going to come to this. And these meetings are great in that they're having the person, but we put this up on the screen so that we know, hey, here's the process here. So if you're on Zoom, you can see again, this is what we're doing. And uh, more than anything, I think you keep the name the same, that would be great. So she will it affect us as a family, yes, it will. It will affect the community, that's just more important, right? So we you know, if the community wants this, we know, we know what we think is important, but it has to matter to everyone here, but go harder than everyone here. Otherwise, it's, otherwise, I think the change will be made because we've seen this happen in previous, uh, in previous questions, guidance, and many different policies, right? There's no ways to buy example for that. And the apprehension comes from not knowing what is going wrong. Uh, and that's all I've ever wanted to do uh, as, far, as a part of being in this group is to have some sort of perspective and make sure that we are giving detailed information and bullet points to everyone that is that are involved in the process. I leave a lot of meetings thinking that we could have probably done that in a different way. I'm more acting on it. I'd rather get things done in a way that I don't see if you get to things, get to things that I see make a set of other way. There are a lot of programming issues that we're not getting to because. We're spending half our time doing that. And uh, I just can't do that. I think we need to get a more action oriented. We get the community a way of action, actually having a say, and also everything here, we can have a say. The only way we can do that is if we actually know what is going on. Instead of a lot of presentations, I can just go with the community first. I don't listen to the community first. So I think we're going to go back to uh, comments from the commission, please, Mark. Thanks. Um, I just want to suggest that what's very frustrating for me as a commissioner is that we are purely an advisory body, right? We don't make any decisions. And sometimes they, you know, what's your, what's your opinion? The fact is that we send out surveys and opinion things and such, the city council will end up making a final decision. And in my personal opinion, it would be completely heinous for them to change the city. To me, this is officious. They need to go through this process and name all of the things. At the end of the day, the name's not going to change in my opinion. What they're going to do is they're going to add names. Is the name, and then there's this room is this, and this room is this, and I think that there's a lot of there's much ado about it. Literally, that this is my hope. I think it would be just ridiculous for the city council to, to make this change. And now that's on record for whatever it's worth. Um, I think that they basically are looking at you know they're they're setting criteria for. This room is going to be called this. This room is going to be called that. But I, I would be very surprised should they make a decision to, to, to abolish this. And listen, your grandmother, your mom, obviously very special, but very important to the community. And it, it just, it, I mean, I'm not a city council person, but it would just be ridiculous for them to make this change. It just makes no sense. So. There's an officious aspect to, to all of this, and I'm hoping that that is in fact the case. Any other comments or questions? Well, I'd just like to add to that because I, I was appreciative of actually seeing in our agenda packet, and I wish we had put it up on the screen the new criteria uh, for naming because that was the first time I saw. Oh, we've actually got a process. When I looked at it at home, it seemed to me that it's going to stay on that Harris based on what that what that process was, unless it's decided that's not an existing place because it was torn down and there's a new existing place. I mean, this is me talking out loud, trying to 
suss out what does this mean. I just want to note that I've been a library commissioner for many years now and uh, predated Facebook, now Meta's generous offer to build this. I seem to recall at the time that Facebook and now Meta disavowed any interest in having this building named after them. And Correct. what I saw at the very beginning of this generous offer and before uh, the Oneta Harris building was even taken down, before we had any plans for the new one, is the stress of a community wanting to know what's the name going to be. And it, it, it seems to me that the stress of this robs us of the joy of building something new. Because every time I've gone to any public meeting about this, the naming has come up. So again, to Mark's point, we have no sway, we have no vote. But my opinion is this stress has gone on for so long and it seems so unnecessary. And so I, you know, personally, my support is also to just have this building be named the Oneta Harris Center and move on. Like all twelve. Pardon me? Would you suggest that for all twelve? Well, I mean, we're, we're, we're going to have a building and then again, to Mark's point, we may have a library within the building. We're going to have a pool. We're going to have a restroom. We're going to have a maker space. I mean, there are a lot of naming opportunities within some, but you know, this is, this is just my internal frustration sitting through so many meetings, listening to the stress of the community over this and, and a lack of excitement about what this great thing is going to be because of that stress. That's my comment. I would also clarify that um, we don't get to vote on the names, but our job as um, an advisory commission is to listen to people who live here and um, pass on the messages. And so therein lies the little power that we have. And um, and I don't think it's easy to make it. Um, so we can work up. Any other comments? And and I appreciate whoever figured out how to put the naming, the naming. Oh, thank you. So um, if, I, if I could, I'll just weigh in, just sort of reiterate what's in the materials for this meeting and not in the agenda packet. And again, this is item number two on the staff report. So it's kind of a sexy little tiny bit. I, I will read it again and get into points well taken and make sure folks on Zoom or can and it's actually the same thing we are. So July 20, this is the process the city council has set forth. July 26, the Parks and Recreation Commission and Library Commission will reopen a four week public comment period for residents to provide input for naming or dedicating the new facility and for each of its five major programs and process as before. Uh, then for those four weeks, City staff continuing to conduct that outreach, compiling with the community members, in addition to the input that's already come in. Um, then August 23rd, the um, this is from direction from the city council that the Parks and Recreation Commission and the Library Commission jointly meet again, consider all that input and the naming policy, and recommend the city council, recommend the city council up to three potential names or dedications to the overall facility, and then also recommend up to three names or dedications for each of the five major components, which are community center, public library, senior center, new center, and aquatic center. And then in September, uh, if we determine, and we really do need to do that by September, because the uh, facility will open a few months later. We will literally need to wait for signs at that point. So no later than September. Um, the city council would review those recommendations and the community input. Any additional input to come with that point? And then would make that submission. And then for the overall facility, and then uh, and name or dedication for the overall facility, name or dedication for each of the five. Now, the decision rests with the city council. Now, what they have put forth, though, is they want to make sure that there's a process like there is for any other new facility that's being constructed and um, that there's community input 
And you know, I think it's um, it can be messy, it can be frustrating for sure. But I think you know that's the the tools, the input that the city council needs in order to make a very informed decision there. Um, and so that's kind of where we are with the timeline. I just want to reiterate that the process itself hasn't changed, it's just shifting. Let me just suggest to, to Kristen's point that we really should take hold of this thing and say, okay, this is what we think is the best name for the facility. These are two or three other names, and that's the that's the input that we want from the community. What are the other names? And and not necessarily should so and so be on the name of the library, but what are some of the other names that, that are, you know, what is the list? That's what we need to come up with so that we can inform the city council and create a short list. And that's going to be our way of, of having seen them doing that. I think. That's what I was just thinking about. Was like, do we want to provide three names, or do we want to provide one? To clarify that it's council's direction is up to three. Yeah. So yeah. one is in that. That's so what <laughs> <laughs> um, That's for that's for the main building. So oh. we may decide that it's it's no other. But then there are other things that we uh, need to right. Do, do each of the parts need to be managed, or can there just could there just be one unit? Well, I, I think the city council is seeking because the new facilities um, to to be able to, to identify what are we going to refer them to the as, right? What are we going to refer well, to the branch library as? What are we going to refer to the center as? What are we going to refer to the overall facility as? So, you know. I think that's the point is what do you call this? It's not just that, Sean, but with all due respect, Renata Harris is not the only woman of influence. There were other people that deserve credit that that we can remember, you know, the community remembers and, and can honor in that way. So it's not just what do we call it, but we're honoring somebody at the same time. So it's an opportunity to do more than just preserve the present, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the way I look at it. Yeah, this this was. Uh, I appreciate all the feedback and input. And uh, as a former history major, I, uh, I'm always I'm always interested in history. Um, so thank you for that. And actually, uh, the community chapter was one of the cool things about the Vietnamese community. Um, if if I may, we're going to go for those of you following the program. Which we haven't followed. We're going to go back now to um, section E, um, regular business. Um, so, under regular business, the Library and Parks and Recreation Commission will consider recommendations from city staff on policy matters or administrative actions that require commission approval. Our first item is E1, approving the minutes from the January 25th, 2023 joint meeting. At this time, if you'd like to make a public comment on this item, please bring a comment card forward. If you're on Zoom, it's not by the staff liaison by using the phone feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen. If you dial in, you can use star nine to engage the link. No comments. And there will be a roll call vote, but many people have to tweet. If you could just say your name and then we vote, please, it would be much appreciated. Sure. Okay, so um, we're going to open it up for a joint commission discussion. Would a commissioner like to make a motion to approve the minutes from the joint meeting? And would someone second that? I'll second that. Okay. Um, and actually, I think we're going to take roll call. Wait, yes. Commissioner Theria, will you Yes. Yeah, Oh, uh, my name is Katie Hadrovich. I was not at that meeting, but given that no one has um, had any objections to anything that's in the meeting minutes, I will vote for it. Uh, Alan Cohen, I approve. Mayor Bunyagi, approve. Ada Shanreki, approve. Mark Brennan, yes. Kristen Leaf, approve. Mayor Bunyagi, approve. Mayor Bunyagi, approve. 
Okay, so um, section E2, advisory body meeting format and attendance requirements, Assembly Bill 2449, just cause and emergency circumstances. This is the moment we've all been waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> Two and a half hours. Uh, Rhonda, can you put up the? Uh, I'm sorry. So, uh, just uh, I'll be as brief as possible. Um, state of emergency ended at, at the end of February, so Governor Newsom uh, changed the rules that we were operating under while we were meeting um, during the state of emergency. So there are new rules in effect now. Um, uh, three different ways um, that one can uh, uh, participate remotely for me. So the the short the short uh, version of this is um, we're back in person now, and we need in person uh, forums for our meetings. Uh, there are three ways that you can participate remotely. There's the old Brown Act way, which is to say you have to uh, let the staff know that you're not going to be on, at the meeting that you will be participating remotely. We have to know in time to put that on the agenda before it goes out. You have to post the agenda uh, at the remote location, wherever you're at. So uh, at your house, um, at a hotel, and the public has to have access to that location, to that remote location. So those are the old ground act rules. Uh, go ahead, for Sean. Um, that, so the, the next two, uh, um, the next two ways to participate remotely are, are under this assembly body 2449. The first is just cause, and the second is emergency circumstances. Uh, a good reminder here on the slide that public participation, remote public participation is not impacted at all. Next slide, please. Uh, we went through the traditional Brown Act requirements, posted on the door, Address of the remote petition site on the agenda. Still need an in forum, um, in person forum. Slide. Uh, here's the first uh, new set of circumstances to just cause. Again, forum in person. Uh, just cause can be used uh, two meetings per year, and just cause can be used for the following uh, reasons the child care or caregiving. A child parent, grandparent, grandchild, spouse, domestic partner that requires a uh, member to participate remotely, contagious illness that prevents a member from attending in person, uh, a need related to physical or mental disability, to travel while on business of the legislative body or another state or local agency. So that's probably not going to apply to the Parks and American Library Commission. If these guys still travel on business, still in Parks and American. Uh, in order to use just cause, and uh, Vice Chair Baskin used it tonight, um, let us know as soon as possible. Uh, the chair will call at the beginning of the meeting if there's anyone who's participating remotely for, for just cause, and then you provide a very general description of the reason why you're uh, participating remotely. So you don't have to go into a lot of details. You don't have to, uh, and, and you shouldn't divulge any sort of personal medical information. Uh, next slide, please. Emergency circumstances can be used up to 20% of the regular meetings a year. Um, so that's two meetings for us. Um, and it is a physical or medical or family medical emergency that prevents you from attending the person. Um, this is, I don't know why this is this uh, distinct from the just cause, but um, it is distinct. So it's handled a little differently. Next slide, please. Um, you have to say that you need uh, to participate remotely for emergency circumstances um, and provide a general description of the, the circumstances uh, related to that remote appearance. It's short, um, that you don't have to, again, disclose any personal information. Next slide, please. Um, and this is a weird one. You have to uh, you have to disclose whether there are any people over the age of eighteen years old uh, present in the room with. You. I'm not sure why you have to do that. The the legislative body, so the commission or combined commissions in this case, would have to vote to add the emergency circumstances to the agenda at the head of the meeting, 
And then if they voted to add it to the to the meeting, then there would be a vote taken to approve the emergency situation. And those steps are required before the, the bulk of the Okay, more rules. If you're participating remotely under just cause or emergency circumstances, you have to keep your camera and light on. You can't um, participate with your camera off. And that we have to do a roll call vote um in order um alphabetical order with the presiding uh member of ones and interestingly according to robert's rules and orders you all can vote yes no abstain or pass and if you vote pass we have to come back to you and then we have to vote yes no, no. Um, the reason for that little wrinkle is because alphabetically Someone may have to always vote first, and maybe they will be the power of the other in the first slide. So they give the option to Slide. Six. <laughs> okay. Um, as fast as I could. Uh, any questions? Because I know that's a lot of information. Uh, I think if I were to boil it down to a nugget, it's we're basically back in person. Let me step back a little bit so I can see everybody. I didn't see this hand when I'm first. Um, Just a quick question. Yeah, right. No, ne not necessarily divulging the personal information, but you have to say, my son is sick. Or, or my family member is sick. Yes. Okay. But that's yeah. not, not the disease, not no, the no, no. name of the child. No, no, no. Not required. Not required. The, the, the in person form is for the entire length of the meeting or? I think you have to have an in-person forum for the entire meeting. I mean, we could just go in for forum or no in-person. No, we didn't. We still have some more in forum. But you're you're correct. You, you have to maintain a forum throughout the meeting. You can't like have a forum and then everybody fails. <laughs> is the is the happen. main difference between the regular illness type, the just cause illness, and the emergency? It doesn't have to do with the timing. So, in terms of when you would be notified. I thought so, but apparently on the just cause, they say they ask that you notify staff as soon as possible, that it can be up to the start of the meeting. Okay. So I, I would have to go back and read the language of the legislation to really figure out that fine distinction. I think my guess is that the legislature is attempting to carve out, you know, we're, we do a lot of things remotely now, and they wanted to sort of give commissioners some slots to do some things remotely because... It's more convenient to do that, but then there are emergencies that pop up, and they also wanted to give some slots for. I came down with something, and I really can't be there, and maybe I used up two slots for family during So it's two and two per year, um, and we still have to have a, a in person for that. And happy to answer questions as we go along, and. I'll pull in the city clerk for an extra interpreter to help if you because she's much better at her stuff. So, this is silly, but in Jennifer's case, she has to post, she had to post something or not? No, she used, she, she used just cause. She used just cause. Have you do not have to post anything. Post anything. That's the old Brown Act rules, yes. which the, the whole idea of all of these rules is to conduct business that affects the community in person so that the community has a chance to see what's going on and a chance to comment on things. If everybody were um, meeting remotely and not letting anybody know who they were, turning on their cameras, it's it's just it gives a lot more opportunity for shadiness and interpretation of shadiness even if there wasn't any shadiness going on. Thanks for hanging with me. So I I think we ended up addressing commission questions. Um, are there any public questions? At this time, if you'd like to make a public comment on this item, please bring your comment forward. If you want to, please note that staff is on the to raise the commission at the bottom of the Zoom screen. The dialing in is used for 19 days to raise the Okay, well, thank you, Nick, uh, for that information um i for those of you following the program <laughs> we are back to f and um zooming through informational items informational items 
are transmitted to the Library and Parks Recreation Commission and staff's effort to provide an update on matters of importance to the commissions. Informational items are not action items. However, a commissioner, city staff member, or a member of the public may request to make a comment or ask a question on any of the informational items. Um, item number one is suggestion box feedback. So the uh, suggestion box feedback is compiled, placed in the agenda packet. If there are any questions or comments on that, I'd uh, love to hear them, but it's good to provide for your information. I had one quick question because it sounded like you were the one replying the most. <laughs> is, it, is, is it an anonymous staffer that's applying to those or is there someone designated or is it based on the interest of, of the question? Who's responding to that? Yeah, we, we actually try to sign the staff's responses. Um, the comments coming in, we take the names out just for the privacy right, that right. they're making a comment. Um, and generally it's kind of like, what is their focus area? So if it's a comment kind of about the library, typically we go to the library supervisor with more energy and we make, um, if it's uh, recreation related, the one that might be the one that So it does kind of depend on the, okay. on the area. There's a diversity of comments in there, uh, obviously. And, and I got, I'm always curious, was there something taken away in sort of a holistic way, like, oh, there's this theme across this library thing that, that's influenced decisions from a uh, um, library? And... I mean, I think we, we take the suggestions and, and put them into practice like, all the time. I, I think one just in the slow dispatch was about um, having a way of, you know, have, first of all, being able to check out video games. Um, which also the DVD player. Suggestions, yeah, another one to um, have DVD players in the library so people can take the DVD off the shelf and watch it right there. And um, sometimes larger themes emerge uh, at certain points in time, a uh, topic that pickleball that they kind of like a theme, and so we, we take all that information and uh, you know, try to incorporate it. I guess what I was trying to figure out was that specifically the DVD player one, the response from the from the, from the um, city was, yeah, we're going to we're looking for number doing that. Yes, yeah. it wasn't clear whether that was something that was already planned, or just we're kind of fulfilling something in advance, or was that a reaction to the thing? And again, my question is, if it was a reaction to it, did you go, oh, are there these other things that? And I'm just kind of curious what the what the re, you know, how it informs the future, not just when I script we're responding to this specific ask. But what did it mean? Oh, there is this thing about, you know, so there's the game, you know, things. Sort of thing. Did that result in a broader picture of, you know, maybe there's other things. There's a roadmap for other kinds of hardware things that are you specific know, hardware. It does. So, I mean, since we're on the topic of like technology access and different formats, I think just on the, the video game and DVD comments that came in, kind of the same batch, sure. like, oh, people are still using physical discs. Right, that's a format that's very durable, and we have folks who you know want to be able to get those formats at the library. We shouldn't be retiring them anytime soon, even though maybe the zeitgeist is that everybody's streaming. It turns out complete people are playing games on this, so we want them from the library and they can use on this. And not only that, they want some of the hardware to access those things. So you know, just you know, you can kind of transpose that to some of the other. Suggestions that come in, but we, we do kind of look at it that way. I mean, it, it, obviously, the recession would be like you have CDs as well. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you loan CD players? You know, like, um, you know, if not, why, why wouldn't you give in this? Really, it finishes off the modalities of media you have. There is, so, so. yeah, good question. Um, and maybe in that one, since we haven't really gotten any requests for um, CD players. I believe DVD players can play CD because I I guess that would be a way to advertise that we, we have these media players for play media. I mean, I, I, yeah, I'm just trying to sort of close off things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, no, this, this feedback from everyday things is super helpful and I hope that helps us see gaps. Some of you still waiting for the 8-track tape, please. Um, thank you. Thank you for those questions and comments. Um, Ashley, do we have any uh, public comment? 
I know it's getting late. We're almost done. We're in the final lap, kids. Um, we covered topic F2, the community naming process. Um, and now we're going to jump to commissioner reports, um, individual commissioner reports. Would any commissioner like to make a short report on items of interest to the joint commission? Sort of making a quick comment, if we can just jump back to suggestions for a second. I think there are some really, really informative ones and some good ones. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the noise that's been created at Elon, whether it's pickleball or whether it's the zip line or whatever it is. And one guy said something and then followed up on it, which is this noise abatement thing on fences and, and things that may, I don't know, we keep talking about how nothing is working. So maybe that's something that we should be thinking about. Yeah, agreed. And I think um, that's one thing we are looking at as part of the, uh, the addendum to the Council of Asia Facilities Master Plan to include pickleball, since pickleball really wasn't in the plan. And since noise is kind of one of the concerns about pickleball, um, there, there are different mitigation techniques you can put on the fence. And so we'll look at that. Well, and the zip line as well, right? It's not just pickleball. Right. And so the zip line kind of goes along with that. It's a little bit different of an application. Um, we're not necessarily doing that as part of the personal facilities master plan, but in, in that case, um, it might have to be more with the another fence. So we are looking at those options. Great comment. Thank you for throwing that out. Maybe maybe moving to the last week of April and June So um this is this will be my last five percent that will not be available for that. Yeah. So I just want to acknowledge that that a great time I've had on the commission, the very interesting exchanges with the community, with the rest of the commissioners, with staff, certainly. Um appreciate the year I had to, to be uh to be chair and, and the experience of that and uh, wish the commission in and, and I'm you know, look forward to going back you know, to the area and seeing uh, seeing the the, the community center finished off and and uh, you know, you know, so all this foundation has been laid for the last several years. Thank you for for supporting me through that year as the chair and and for the you know, wonderful lessons of being involved with the, some aspect of civil government. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, David. Thank you. I'm really a kind of pleasure. Uh, I have a very small commission of report. I only took a library, but just as a reminder that I'm the liaison to the Library Foundation, the Memorial Park Library Foundation, for those of you that are on the Library Commission. And uh, we do have a board meeting tomorrow. So uh, I'll be at that board meeting and ready to tell you a brief report from the staff at the next meeting. Well, I'm happy to. During this meeting, so you can get home, have dinner, and go to sleep. And one, one, oh, that's one more thing. So, before we break, um, first of all, we will say the seat before you at the grand opening. But also, I just wanted to remind commissioners that we are recruiting for advisory body vacancies currently. And the deadline is Friday, April 7th. So, folks who are interested in serving on one of our commissions, like the Parks and Recreation Commission, or the Library Commission, which we have vacancies coming up, uh, please go to menlopark.gov, put in that application. Again, the deadline is Friday, April 7th. And if you know someone who is a Menlo Park resident and might be interested or a good fit to serve, please encourage them to apply. There you go. Okay. So if I, if there are no other comments or commercials. <laughs> <laughs> And the rain has stopped and the internet is working. I'd like to adjourn this joint meeting um, at 9, 13 p.m. Um, thank you so much. Have a good evening. Safe travels home, everybody. Thank you.
Good job, Good job. 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 Good job.